Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, <clears throat> the wills of thy faithful people, that they plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works may of thee be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn to verse 6 of hymn 360. We have a couple of hymns on the consecration of the church. Uh, we have one more, which is the very same words to a different tune. God in three persons, Father everlasting, Son co-eternal, ever-blessed Spirit, thine be the glory, praise, and adoration, now and forevermore. Amen. Tell their influence by the prayer book, or the prayer book is influenced by church history. Or again with <clears throat> Jasper Ridley, <clears throat> we looked at his Nicholas Ridley and uh, the beginnings of his work on Elizabeth the One. We have we're working on him with uh, Thomas Cranmer, a delightful biography there. But he's also got others that we're going to be looking at. John Knox, the Tudor Age. This is a short, three hundred fifty-six page, published in nineteen eighty-one, short history of England. It's just kind of nice to my son John. <clears throat> Dedicated up one of the others to his daughter, Barbara. Contents. Introduction. Britain before the English. <clears throat> the English and the Christians, 446 to 686. <clears throat> Al <clears throat> Alfred Canute, William the Conqueror, 686 to 1066. The Norman rulers in Henry I. 1066 to 1135, lawlessness and order, 1135 to 1216, Edward I and Robert Bruce, 1216 to 1329, chapter 6, the twilight of chivalry and the peasants' revolt, 1329 to 81, <clears throat> 7, Agincourt and the War of Roses, 1381 to 1501, English, uh, Henry VIII and Religious Revolution, 1501 to 1558. Elizabeth I, the Protestant Victory, 1603. The Cavaliers and the Roundheads, which I think we're going to look for his book on that. The Restoration and the Glorious Revolution, 1660 to 1714, the 18th century, 1714 to 83. Social upheaval and counter-revolutionary war, 1783 to 1815. Victorian glory, 1815 to 1902. The growth of democracy in the Great War, 1902 to 22. The 20th century, decline or progress, 1922 to 79. Britain before the English. In 5,000 years, which have elapsed. Since some form of civilized life has existed in Britain, 179 <clears throat> generations of human beings have lived here. Most of them lived in a stable society in which kings and noblemen often fought each other, but in which the ordinary men and women from youth to old age lived the same kind of life which their fathers and mothers had lived before them and which their sons were to live after them. But 11 of these <clears throat> 175 generations have lived in a period of extraordinary change. It's quite a way to look at it. These, those members of these 11 generations, a small minority who reached the age of 80, found themselves in their old age in a very different Britain from that of their youth. There were people who lived from 80, 20 to 100, 395 to 475, 585 to 665, 
860 to 940, 1030 to 1110, 1310 to 1390, from 1460 to 1540, from 1540 to 1620, from 1630 to 1710, from 1780 to 1860, from 1900 to 1980. They witness the most interesting periods of English history. <clears throat> At the root of all history lie terrain and climate. In Britain, there is a considerable difference between the north and the south and between the east and the west. In the south, the average summer temperature is nearly 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the north. In the dry east, the average yearly rainfall is 25 inches. In many places in the wet west, it exceeds 60 or even 80. The southeast is relatively flat. The northwest is hilly. In the south, the harvest is usually reaped at the beginning of August, only a few weeks later than on the continent of Europe. In the north, it's sometimes not collected until October or even later. Throughout the whole of British history, the majority of the population has been concentrated in the southeast, which has always been an advance of the north in political and social and usually economic development. <clears throat> Except for one strange interlude of 150 years between 8450 and 600, the south has always been in close contact with Europe and has been politically and culturally a part of Europe. The North, for long periods, has been virtually isolated from all of Europe, except Scandinavia. As far as we can tell, the immigrants came to Britain about 5,000 years ago, having sailed here from Spain and Portugal and landed in Cor Cornwall and Devon. Some of them went further north, but most settled on the Sal Salisbury Plain. Other immigrants came during the next 3,000 years until the population of Britain was about 400,000. <clears> the Iberians from Spain and Portugal were perhaps the ancestors of the small, dark-haired inhabitants of Cornwall and Wales today. The Celts from Brittany, Normandy, Flanders, the Netherlands, and Denmark were tall, with red hair and blue eyes. Many of the immigrants went to Wiltshire, where they erected the great stone monuments of Stonehenge and Hofbury. The inhabitants of the island were known as Britanni to the foreign traders who brought, bought their tin and sold them wine. The Romans later miswrote the name as Britanni and called their country Britannia, which is why we call it Britain now. The Romans first came in 55 BC when Julius Caesar, the Roman commander in Gaul, crossed the Straits of Dover with his army and landed near Deal. But though Caesar came again next year and advanced as far as Herefordshire, he made no attempt to conquer the island. And it was not until 97 years later that the emperor Claudius invaded Britain and the territory south of the Humber and east of the Severn were annexed to the Roman Empire. The Romans <clears throat> were determined to conquer the whole island and to evade the territory now known as Wales and Scotland. Welsh resistance had collapsed by AD 77, but the Romans tried unsuccessfully for 130 years after the Caledonians in Scotland. At the end of the 13th century, <clears throat> When the kings of England decided to conquer Wales and Scotland, they conquered Wales in three campaigns of a few months each and tried for 80 years to conquer Scotland before giving up the attempt. 1900 years after Agricola and 700 years before Edward I, the movement for independence and devolution wins the support of large sections of, pop of the population of Scotland but hardly any support in Wales. Agricola marched as far north as Forfar, and after defeating the Caledonians, built a wall from the Forth to the Clyde to prevent them from raiding to the south of it. 
but after a hundred years of intermittent warfare, the Ro Romans withdrew to the more formidable defensive barrier of Hadrian's Wall, which stretched from coast to coast just north of the Tyne and became the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. The region of the Roman occupation was to divide Britain into five regions, the south of England, Wales, the north of England, the Scottish Lowlands, and the Scottish Highlands, <coughs> which for the next 1,800 years were to have a different development and to a considerable extent a different history. The south of England, bounded by the Severn and the Humber, was incorporated into the Roman Empire with the same Roman way of life as Gaul, Italy, and North Africa. Wales, except for its eastern fringe along the present-day boundary with England, was outside the Roman Empire. Its inhabitants carefully watched by the Roman garrisons at Carillon and Chester left the Romans in peace and were left in peace by them, isolated from the life and history of the island. The north of England between the Humber and the Tyne was occupied by the Romans, who established their military high command in Britain at York. But though York was one of the great cities of the empire, the Roman civilians who lived there hardly ever ventured beyond the walls of the city. And the, plain, and the 10 mile strip of the plain of York on both sides of it, and the Yorkshire Mire, moors and dales, and the rest of the country north of the Umber were untouched by Roman civilization. The area between the Tyne and the Forth and Clyde was a no man's land, which was under Roman authority between 80 and 98, and between 142 and 184, but was then abandoned to the ferocious Caledonians. The fifth region of Britain, <clears throat> the highlands north of the Tay, was never conquered, though on two occasions, Roman punitive expeditions penetrated into the territory, the Emperor Severus in 209, going at least as far <clears throat> north as Ivernus and possibly reaching John O'Groats. In the south of England and the plain of York, more than 100,000 settlers, most of them soldiers or civil servants, but including some traders and other private individuals, fraternized and inter intermarried with British aristocracy, many of whom were granted Roman citizenship and lived like <clears throat> wealthy Romans in villas. But most of the inhabitants of Britain worked on the land as serfs of their Roman or Romanized British masters. The, the more oppressive labor in the nationalized iron, copper, tin, gold, and coal mines, which the Romans developed much more systematically than the British of earlier times, was performed largely by convicted prisoners. <coughs> Great roads were built all across Britain. They were not as straight as they are traditionally supposed to have yeah, been. After being allowed to decay for 1,200 years, they became the roads of modern England. The Romans' greatest contribution to the development of Britain was the introduction of urban life and Christianity. Their towns were small compared with those of later centuries. The largest, London, covered 330 acres and probably had a population of about 15,000. None of the other towns had much more than 5,000 inhabitants, but unlike the villages and hilltop fortresses of pre-Roman Britain, there were towns with an urban lifestyle and culture like the other cities throughout the Roman Empire. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by Roman authority in Palestine about 14 years before the conquest of Britain. But within a generation, Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire, chiefly among the lower classes in the towns, although it was savagely persecuted by the Roman government. Many centuries later, English Christians invented
untrue stories about the early visits of Christ's followers to Britain. But there's no doubt that there were Christians in Southeast England within a hundred years of Christ's death. And during the next 200 years, their faith spread. They had a few followers even beyond the bounds of Roman civilization in Wales and North and Caledonia. At the beginning of renewed the persecution of Christians throughout the empire. According to later Christian writers, a Roman soldier named Alban suffered martyrdom in Britain in 304. There's no contemporary record of his death, but the story was being told by British Christians 125 years later. Alban was stationed in the town of Verulamian, Lamian, which is today called St. Alban's after him. He was not a Christian, but felt sympathy for a persecuted British Christian and hid him in his house. When he was arrested and charged with sheltering this fugitive from justice, he declared that he had decided to become a Christian himself and was sentenced to death. He was taken to the place of execution on a hill outside the town, but the soldier who was ordered to behead him refused to do so. The soldier and Elbin were then both put to death by another soldier who was more amenable to military discipline. Within 10 years of Diocletian's persecution, a remarkable change had taken place in the fortunes of the Christian church. In 306, Diocletian's successor, the Emperor Constantius, died at York after conducting a successful punitive expedition against the Caledonians. The army there chose his illegitimate son, Constantine, who was with him at York as the new emperor. Other claimants to the throne were supported by army units throughout the empire, and Constantine had to fight them. His mother was a barmaid in Turkey, where Constantius had been stationed at the time. And it seems that, like so many other girls from lower kick classes, she was a secret Christian. During his struggle for the imperial throne, Constantine decided to enlist the support of the Christians against his rivals. And after emerging as victor, he granted toleration to the Christians and then established Christianity as virtually the official religion of the empire though he himself became a Christian only on his deathbed. Under the Christian empire, the church established a very efficient internal administration, and the Christians in Britain were organized into dioceses under bishops who represented them at international councils of the church at Arles and Remini. It was a British theologian, Pelagius, who early in the 5th century put forward the doctrine of free will, which continued for over a thousand years to be denounced as the Pelagian heresy by the international church. But the Roman Empire was decaying. By the beginning of the fifth century, barbarian tribes from Eastern Europe were overrunning the empire and threatening Rome itself. The Roman government eventually withdrew all their armed forces from Britain leaving their fellow countrymen there and the Britons to their own devices. Roman civilization in Britain did not collapse overnight when the legions left, but almost immediately the Caledonians broke through Hadrian's Wall and ravished the north of England. And they repeatedly ravished south of the wall during the next decades. The Romans and Romanized natives in Britain lived for another generation amid slow decay and growing fear of the future. When the Bishop of Auxerre, St. Germanus, traveled from Gaul to Britain in 429, he reported that social and religious life was continuing in Britain, but he was worried about the demoralization and the slow collapse. Things had become worse 18 years later when Germanius again visited Roman and total disaster what? was at hand. 
In 446, the government in Rome finally refused to send any military aid to protect Britain against the Caledonians. Meanwhile, northern Gaul was overrun by barbarian from, from Germany, by the Franks, who ultimately gave their name to the country which they conquered. These barbarians were not traitors and did not wish to have anything to do with the inhabitants of Britain, who were now cut off from Rome. For the first time for several centuries, Britain was totally isolated from Europe. After Germanus's second visit in 447, there is no record of any other traveler from Europe visiting Britain for 150 years. Chapter 1, The English and the Christians, 446 to 686. Students who study history of events since 1500 can read for every de decade that they investigate thousands of contemporary public records, private letters, diaries, books, pamphlets, and newspapers. But we have only four sources of information about the Britain between 447 and 597. The earliest book is written by a British monk Gildas at about 545. The second is the chronicle of an Anglo-Saxon monk, Beda, the Venerable Bede, which he published in 731. The third is by Welsh monk, Nennius, who wrote, between 785 and 88, 808. The fourth is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle compiled under the direction of King Alfred in 895. Gildas is the only one of these who is in any sense contemporary. And even in his case, most of the incidents which he described took place before he was born. While Bede, Nennius, and the authors of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle were writing about events as far removed from them as the period stretching from Henry VIII to the Napoleonic Wars is from us. But both Bede and Nennius had read earlier written histories which have long since been lost. And the four chronicles all agree on some matters, despite the fact that Gildas and Nennius were Britons and Bede and the authors of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle were English. These authors all state that after the Roman government in 446 refused the British request for military aid against the Caledonians, the Britons asked the Angles and Saxons in Germany and Denmark for help. Nennius provides more details. The British chieftain, Vortigern, who the vacuum which followed the departure of the Roman army had made himself king of South Britain, asked the Jutes of Jutland to send mercenaries to protect him against the Caledonians. The Jutes arrived under their leaders, the brothers Hengist and Horsa. They defeated the Caledonians and as a resort, reward were granted land in the Isle of Thanet. They proceeded to bring more Jutes and their families from Jutland and expanded into other parts of Kent. The Britons then rallied under a general, Ambrosius Aurelianus, who was descended from an aristocratic Roman family. They defeated the Jutes in a battle near Aylesford in Kent, in which Horsa was killed. A great mound, which can still be seen today, is probably his tomb. Hengist and his defeated followers retreated to Jutland, but soon returned and reconquered Kent, where Kanks died at an advanced age, perhaps in 488. The details of the conquest of Kent by the Jutes, supplied by Nennius, make a story as exciting as those of Homer and show Hengst as a brave, cruel, and cunning leader in the style of Odysseus. Um, I'm going to have to call it to an end here. Grandpa, don't. It's fine.